lovely panel. I'm delighted to be here with you all. Um, I'm going to start uh, by asking Sue and all the other panellists what the most significant story they've worked on has been. It could be something that you're most proud of or it could be the most significant. The two aren't necessarily the same, but you kick it off, Sue. Oh, God, I thought this was a really difficult question, but I think the thing that's, that, that came to the top of my mind, uh, very trivial things, certainly I thought it at the time, I was working on the FT, and I started writing mainly about Whitehall, and I got hold of this story about Gordon Brown, who was then Prime Minister, hadn't been Prime Minister for that long, and this wonderful story about him losing his temper and turfing one of the number 10 garden girls out of her chair because he was so angry that things weren't being done mm. quickly enough. And after that, there were a whole series of stories, some of them mine, some of them other people's, about Gordon throwing phones, uh, people, a minister coming to him and saying, um, Don't, you, know, you can't really argue, I, these numbers, I got them from your people. To, at which point Gordon rushed over to his private uh, office and said, who the hell gave him my figures? And this was to one of his own ministers. <laughs> and why it was an important story, which surprised me at the time, and I thought it was a good, p interesting piece of trivia, this attacking the garden girls. The garden girls are the secretaries at number 10, and everybody loves the garden girls. I mean, it's unheard of. To, for any politician to attack the Garden Girls, was that it told you something about Gordon as Prime Minister and his, his, the fact that he was just not comfortable in the role. Uh, and then, of course, uh, that continued very much, I think, for the rest of his premiership, despite of his many abilities. Mm. <coughs> yeah, how about you, Andrew? Um, I think I'd probably go back to just after Tony Blair was elected Prime Minister. Remember, he swept in... Uh, promising to end Tory's sleeves and he had a halo uh, above his head. And the Sunday Telegraph got hold of a story. Then he had a bit of the story that Blair had ushered Bernie Eccleston, who was head of Formula One racing, into number 10 for a private meeting. And there had been a donation. They didn't know if the donation was £5,000 or £50,000. And they thought it may be linked with the decision by the Blair government to oddly exclude Formula One racing from the ban on cigarette advertising. I was on the Times that day, so on Monday's Times, we had very clearly on the front page that Blair had taken, for the Labour Party, uh, um, £1.4 million. The story was disowned by the Labour spin machine, uh, led by that charming man, <laughs> Alistair Campbell. Uh, and, but later in the day, papers emerged which showed, in fact, I had got the figure wrong. It wasn't £1.4 million that Labour had taken. They'd, in fact, taken one million pounds and another million pounds was in the post. So the story was completely legitimate. Mm -hmm. And what it did was it showed <coughs> that despite all the rhetoric about Tory sleeves, Blair, frankly, was no better. And frankly, what we've seen of him since he's left number 10, I think that story was very prophetic. Yeah, both of you have shown such telling details about, uh, you know, how, how a story can kind of snowball and gather, have impact over time. And how about, how about you? Well, I'm detecting a common theme here, I think, is emerging. Um, as a columnist rather than uh, a you know, news writer, mine is going to be more th thematic, which is really, I was going to say, the biggest uh, story was the Blair-Brown rivalry. As a commentator in those New Labour mm. years, that was just the dominant theme all the time. And it got to such a point, if you were writing commentary, that the, your, you yourself became part of that phenomenon. So that if you were ever called in, I'm sure others here will have had a similar experience, if you ever arranged a sort of private briefing with one of them, uh, with Gordon Brown, say, uh, 20 minutes later, the phone would ring <laughs> from Tony Blair's people who would say, you, we don't feel you've come in to see Tony for a while. Why don't you come in on Tuesday? And you'd have to say, um, I'm a bit, bit too busy on Tuesday at 11 o'clock because you were seeing the guy next door. You were seeing Gordon <laughs> Brown next door. And there was one day when it was literally, one was 11 till 12, the other was 12 till 1. And I was sitting there with a session with Gordon Brown, and you'll remember this. Gordon Brown, when he w warmed up, could really keep going. And he, would, he was like a sort of um, fantastic sort of college tutor or something. And he would start reaching for books from the bookshelves and say, you've got to read this, and if you haven't read that yet, you know, you might let me find this book on you know, the Dutch Protestant revolt of the 16th century. <laughs> you've got to take that. And you'd be looking at a watch thinking, 
Tony Blair's next door and he's, you know, I've got to get there. And so you'd find yourself saying, look, I've got to get this, it's been wonderful. But the one thing you couldn't say to Gordon Brown was, because I'm going to see Tony Blair next door. So it was as if it was some sort of two-timing relationship. And I thought, if that's what it's like even for me, who would see them, you know, once a year maximum, can you imagine what it was like for their colleagues? So the, Gore- the Blair-Brown rivalry really was the dominant political theme. And I think in some ways hugely important because still... Years later, uh, and it's incredible to think this, but it's eight years since Tony Blair stepped down nearly, it is still uh, cast this huge shadow, particularly over Labour. But in a way, all the politics that uh, still runs out is in some ways iterations of that argument. Mm, even the two Ed stories, yeah. Ed Balls mm. and Ed Miliband, and how they get There's on. just versions of that argument. They, yeah. No. There was a time when your phone would ring and the words that really made your heart sink were, it's the Downing Downing Street switchboard, we have the Prime Minister on the line. (laughs) And you'd have a Prime Minister's number, uh, his mobile in your phone, to know not to answer it unless you had an hour to to (laughs) spare. It it was was great high drama, but... (sighs) Contrary to what you might think, we all remember the stories that we miss, actually, and that's, they're the ones that, uh, mm. that you really recall, but that's not the moment for that. Um, on, the, on the mirror, uh, I had a bit of a hairy moment uh, with, a, uh, with the infor- <laughs> information of, uh, of George Bush, uh, just after the Iraq war, had said to Tony Blair, let's bomb Al Jazeera in uh, Qatar. Um, because uh, that station was carrying so much uh, negative news, and I'm hoping that memo will come out in the Chilcot report before I die, because uh, I'm going to come any time soon. <laughs> but uh, I suppose the, uh, the story I did, which had the biggest, <coughs> the biggest impact, and you often don't realise when you're beginning to write the story, was uh, I discovered by accident, it's got to be said, that uh, scientists had discovered that um, BSE, mad cow disease, could be passed to humans. And somebody, uh, somebody told me this and we followed back how they knew and it was the case and we wrote about it. And then, uh, mm. you know, when I was watching 10 million British cattle being burned on funeral pyres and I think it was a 12 billion beef war with, uh, with Europe, you thought, blimey. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a, you know, it's a bit of a bigger impact than I thought it might. Yeah, yeah that's a pretty mm. memorable one. Mm. Steve? Mm. Well, it's interesting that Jonathan uh, and Kevin both referred to the Blair Brown era. That mm. was... You've got commentators in front of you as not kind of the news getters as such, but if you have to make sense of things, that was very challenging because you needed the skills of a psychiatrist as well as sort of political <laughs> journalism. Um, and it was, uh, it, you had to get well below the surface to make sense of it all. So that was a, a really fulfilling assignment, I think, those mad years. Um, but in terms of stories, um, the, the thing that, I kind of am interested in actually is I've got a theory that you don't everything is on the surface in front of our eyes if you choose to see it and I was looking back I did a series of interviews uh, just before the 97 election for the statesman actually Sarah Um, long interviews with all the players from Blair Brown Mandelson Claire Short and they published it as an anthology subsequently I was looking at it the other day for a project I'm on And everything that happened was there on the surface. You Mm -hmm. had Claire Short complaining about what she called the people in the dark, the spin Mm -hmm. doctors, Mm -hmm. Mandelson, Campbell, and she said that they were destroying Tony. Peter Mandelson said to me, Tony wants me to be his spin doctor, his counsellor, but I want to be treated seriously as a cabinet minister. Um, Everything was there (laughs) in advance. And you could have almost written the history of what followed on the basis of those on-the-record exchanges. So I think that was quite an interesting Mm. experiment. Fascinating. In fact, that brings me to my next question. Uh, I was going to ask something else, but this follows so naturally on. What about the impact of of, um, personalities and our writing? I mean, there's Ed Miliband is getting flayed at the moment by some sections of the press. Um, all him, sections of the him, press. Actually. No, all yeah. sections. <laughs> yeah. All sections of the all press. All sections of the press. All sections. Well, yeah, he's hopeless. Yeah, off you go then, Andrew. <laughs> no, it's, people, people like watching cartoons on TV. They don't want a cartoon character in number ten. And I think I was one of the you first. Put it with John Major. Uh, well, um, well, they got rid of him, Kevin. And I think I was one of the Seven first years. person to get a picture of the Wallace and Gromit character, a picture of Ed Miliband. Can you spot the difference? People couldn't. Uh, you know, <laughs> he, the fact is, the Labour Party made an historic mistake. They chose the wrong brother. 
Maguire knows that. He and I, for once, agree on something. Uh, he's not up to it. He's a lightweight. He's not Mr. Darcy, is he? He's Mr. Bean. And that's why we're going to continue to write about it. And I have to say, I don't think there's been any election in modern history where an opposition party has been so far behind on the economy, but at the same time, with the leader that far behind the Prime Minister. And that's the case for Ed Miliband, because, as I say, he ain't up to it. Uh, and one of the things about uh, poor old Ed Miliband, the bacon sandwich. Oh. The reason the bacon sandwich uh, story, his inability to eat one elegantly, well, which of us could? But his tussle with the bacon sandwich summed up um, a feeling uh, of so many people that Ed, as, as you say, just isn't up to it. You know, he's going to freeze energy prices when oil's a hundred dollars a barrel and now it's sort of half that uh, and people uh, although i think some of his messages really resonate with people the idea of a fairer society but they just don't think that uh, milliband is going to begin to be able to deliver that and in that sense i think personalities and impressions even more now than they used to be. But the impression of leaders as we become more presidential in campaigns is really, really important. But the 17 of the 20 opinion polls in February that put uh, Labour ahead of the Tories kind of contradicts your emphasis on personalities. They matter, there's no, there's no, uh, no question, but policies and wider politics matter too. Um, Jim Callaghan used, uh, used to get much higher personal uh, poll ratings than Margaret Thatcher. We know uh, what happened there. Uh, you go back, to, you say, when, when did a party ever win when it was behind on the economy? Believe it or not, in 1997, the Tories were ahead of Labour on the economy. And as you know, yeah, Tony Blair. Yeah, but, but Major was miles mm, behind. I'm behind just, you know, just no, I said sorry to introduce a few no, facts. No, I'm no, sorry. No, 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 you see, there no, they go, you no, see. No, he's only no, a supporter on the panel no. and he's fibbing. What I said was <laughs> there's never been a situation where the leader has been behind both on the economy and in terms of leadership. That's Labour's problem. Newspapers are, in my view, unquestionably as powerful and influential in, as they have ever been in different ways. Some of the readership is online, but they are there. But this is where they can cause problems. That, the, the view you've just heard about Miliband is the, virtually the only view you will read in the next uh, few weeks. It is more three-dimensional than that. And incidentally, that view is heavily... Uh, influencing the BBC portrayal of it. Mm -hmm. That's uh, how powerful it is. But it's not the full picture. Let me just give you two very quick examples. Miliband, for all the obvious flaws that he has got, that everyone in this room knows about, if he gets into number 10, which is still possible, he will be the most experienced incoming leader of the opposition to get that job since Thatcher. Cameron didn't hold a cabinet post, Blair didn't have a cap uh, hold a cabinet post, Thatcher did, and so did Miliband. Miliband also was at the heart of all the insanity of that New Labour era and has learnt some of the tricks that you need in politics. I take a recent example, his response to the straw thing yesterday was quite smart. And it was smart because he's been, he looks about 12, but he's actually been immersed mm in the rhythms of politics for a long time. It's so, it's, it's, what's so interesting is that you said there he looks about 12, and, and Sue's example is about the bacon sandwich, and your example was about Wallace. These are all visual uh, marks that are held against Ed Miliband. When, when you hear the critique against him, it is so often it comes down to, and I don't dis dismiss this because it matters, how he looks. And it's, it's awful to admit this very superficial thing, and yet it seems to go to something uh, quite deep. And it is why newspapers in particular are so important. I remember uh, at a, one of the party conferences, do you remember the one with David Miliband, who you now say is so exalted with and you'd banana. all be wonderful, with the, with the banana. banana yeah. right? Now that image with the banana, mm -hmm. and the photographer was going through and he said, have a look at this. And he showed me, you know how the, auto, the um, far, you know, automatic wind on the, cam uh, the camera can take a uh, hundred pictures in a minute. And he showed me all these pictures, the screen filled up of David Miliband, and almost every one of them was a bad picture. Somehow sort of gurning and looking awkward. Then he flicked onto another one, Cherie Blair. Every picture looked terrible. He said, there's, there's nothing she can do, whatever angle you capture actually looks terrible. Then he, went to, then he went to Tony Blair, and of the 100 pictures there, 99 were wonderful. Maybe there was one poor uh, image. 
And he said, there's just some people are like that. There are some people who, when you meet them in person, they look okay, but the minute you take a still photograph, somehow they look awful. But and this has become how we define these public figures. But it doesn't always, uh, a bad picture doesn't always detract from somebody um, uh, as a leader. Um, and the best example of that is Boris. Remember Boris on that zip wire? Yes. I mean, it's yeah. absolutely awful. I mean, yes. if you can uh, imagine poor Ed Miliband, if that oh. had happened to him, it would, he'd have had to have gone home, home and shot himself. And yet, what did people say about Boris? Oh, did you see those pictures of Boris? Oh, well, Boris, well, you know, it's Boris. And nobody holds it against him. He's seen as a card, still as a very much a player and a potential leader. So I think the thing about the visual images, which are so important, they have to sort of sum up something that people have doubts about that person. It mm. isn't just enough to take a bad yeah, picture. Yeah, and, and it works the other way positively, which is David Cameron, from the beginning, looked the part. Mm. He looks like a prime minister. Ed Miliband's problem is he doesn't look like a yeah. prime minister. And in a way, I sometimes think all these other judgments flow from that. And I think you're right, we do have sort of our you know, deeper misgivings, but in a way, the starting point is instant. You know, I remember there was a focus group which looked at, uh, showed up images in a second of the different party leaders, and they showed up Clegg, and it was a bad word that immediately came out, I think, you know, broken promises or whatever, it was negative. Cameron, PR man. They showed a picture of Miliband, the instant response was no. <laughs> right? I mean, he didn't even get to have a trait, it was just no. <laughs> But uh, the, 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 the exception to that rule is uh, Thatcher, who did not look leaderly in opposition in the late 70s. She looked, fr frankly, this thing about um, a Miliband looking weird and deranged and all the rest of it, look at the photos of her washing up um, <laughs> in about 1978, pretending to be, in inverted commas, an ordinary housewife. And she looks completely demented. Now, <laughs> I don't condemn her for that. Um, uh, but there was a very good quote from Barbara Castle. Power made her beautiful. When mm. she won, mm. it suited her. But she had to win uh, to get to that point. But this and isn't, isn't the point there, though, that she also had some poli <coughs> policies that really defined her? But so and does maybe, Miliband. I mean, so God Miliband. forbid that the press have too many policies uh, that they write about. But on the other hand... Is there just not enough sort of meat besides the presentational no, you know, image you know, to no. feed on? You know what it is? The, the, the press has a huge impact on political debate. Yeah. People, who, people who read newspapers are more likely to vote than the population as a whole. The, the two exceptions are the sun and the star. But every other paper, people are more, are more engaged. Uh, perhaps they choose us, but you know, we don't kind of choose them, as it were. You know, they buy a newspaper because they are in, in, engaged. <coughs> but... The fact, the fact is, and some politicians, some voters think the press has too much of an impact on, on politics. The fact is, there's a right-wing bias because of owner, ownership, which is why Ed Miliband gets it in the neck all the time and David Cameron gets a relatively easy right. I could produce 10 photographs of Cameron eating various uh, products and looking bonkers. I could, I could produce hundreds of pictures of him looking like a walrus on a beach in, uh, in, in Cornwall changing with his Mickey Mouse towel. There was one, one occasion, his, to his misfortune, he went on holiday in Spain and it just happened to be some friends of mine were on the next Sun Lounger. <laughs> and uh, you know, it was just tough for the Prime Minister, uh, who's, uh, who's very conscious of his moobs and uh, you know, goes down and out of the water with a T-shirt, takes it off, goes straight in, comes out, it's straight back on so nobody could see him. Now, if that was Ed Miliband, the right-wing papers would be absolutely slaughtering them. The, da the, da the Daily Mail would be, would be all over him, as I'm you did with a bacon sandwich. About, about newspapers, is you'd think in a way, okay, well, newspapers, aren't they meant to have shrinking readerships, and why does it matter so much? I think Steve touched on this before. The broadcasters, because they are bound by rules of impartiality, etc., they can't themselves take sides, Labour or Conservative, but they then refract all that through the press. Mm -hmm. So if something is consistently on the front page of the Daily Mail, or, uh, or uh, and particularly the Mail has a, an extra influence, we haven't mentioned it yet, um, then the BBC and the, uh, and the others will follow that. And it will take the form of the paper review, is the most obvious form, which these two do so well. But it will also just inform what the Today programme decides is the lead, what news night, what the TV news go on. So newspapers punch so far above their weight in determining, you know, the Miliband problem, it 
begins with newspapers saying bacon sandwich, but it eventually becomes the prevailing conventional wisdom because the broadcasters amplify the print press in this country in a way that isn't the same everywhere else. Well, yeah. here's someone who works for the Mail. Uh, yeah. let, me, let me ask you about the influence. You know, tabloid B, uh, broadsheet, and now, of course, social media. What has the most impact? Um, you just... I think probably still, it, the, the, the Telegraph readership, I worked for the Telegraph for four years, broadly uh, will vote 72, 75% conservative. That is consistent. That doesn't change very much. The daily, I looked at our figures for the Daily Mail. 59% um, of, of readers of the Daily Mail voted conservative at the last general election. There was a swing of about 7% uh, from the previous election. The swing nationally at the, the, over the general election was 5%. So the Mail brought a few a bit of extra support to Cameron, but not that much. But actually, the Mail takes is, has a paper with atti it's a paper with attitude, and uh, it's not just about personality. We, you know, I think we 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 feel the mood of the nation, and I think we're very in touch with it, much more so than Maguire and his dreary left wing <laughs> dronings. You know, and uh, we will we will we will we will point out. We will point out that Red Ed hasn't just got a personality problem, he's got a policy problem. Yeah. For his friend, only this week we saw the flagship policy of Ed Miliband. He's going to reduce tuition fees from £9,000 to £6,000. Here we are, five weeks before the election, duh, they don't know how to pay for it. They're still arguing about it. It's back to the two Eds, like it was with Gordon and Tony. So the mayor will pick up on that and rightly go for it, because our readers are entitled to know. And, yeah, we give the, the Labour Party a hard time, but I tell you, we've given Cameron a pretty hard time too. Uh, a pretty tough time altogether. In fact, it, this has probably been the most difficult relationship the mayor has had with the Conservative Party for years, because quite a few of us on the mail don't really think David Cameron's much of a Tory. Tory, you're a Tory boy. No, he's so out of, but he's so out of touch. She thinks the middle class earn 150 grand and live in two no. million pounds. Housing. Uh, you might, okay. but they don't. Then, don't you love the competitive <laughs> spirit of newspapers? It's uh, it's really what makes them fun, I think. But oh. let's get back to the original point about influence. Sorry, I thought no, Sue was going to say. Oh, I, okay, I just go on then. Say, Sue. Yeah. I think what you said is about the um, newspapers reflecting the mood yeah. of their readers is very important, mm. and I think it is that way round rather than the other way round. Mm. In 1992, it was the Sun what won it mm. when the Tories unexpectedly won. In fact, uh, the research showed that mm. the um, uh, the Sun's readers were already. Um, favouring the Tories um, before the Sun uh, uh, backed them. And in 1997, um, Bob Worcester of Mori was rung up by the Sun's advertising people and they said, have you got any research on what our readers are feeling? And he said, yes, they're favouring Labour by quite a big margin. And a few weeks later, uh, the Sun came out for um, uh, Blair and the Labour Party. And so I think that the important thing for successful newspapers at any rate, is that they're in tune with their readers and that is what, mm. in a way, decides them. It's not just somebody, certainly isn't somebody in an editorial conference thinking, we'll back this or that uh, party and our readers will follow us. It doesn't work no. like can that. I, it's can the I other just, way around. Actually, I just want to move on. I want to ask Jonathan about digital mm. readerships as well because The Guardian and The Mail, in fact, have been very big on that. Um, and then we'll start moving towards questions. So, Jonathan. Uh, so the impact of the digital audience. So, so <laughs> yes. The Guardian, more and more, our readership is online, and so you know our print readership is steadily falling, and but our digital readership is expanding hugely. One thing that's done is made the British conversation in some ways harder to have, because The Guardian readership now is global, and we see the figures for it. You can write a piece, and it will say 49% of the readership for this was in the UK, and 51% was outside. And therefore, having, in a way, that very focused British political discussion is, to some extent, becoming a little bit harder. You know, the test I've always got is, will we ever get to the point where we say, finance minister George Osborne, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which is maybe where the FT are. Uh, the FT has yeah. already crossed this bridge. Mm -hmm. But it does, that has changed the sort of intensity of the, uh, the very local conversation. Uh, that said, the, you, you do, um, you know, the, the, there are people who will still be writing, you know, our Westminster team and our columnists who are still writing about this election. 
uh, and that does happen uh, digitally, and, uh, the, the, and the way through that is social media. And I think the, you know, I, I, this is not a time to get into these sort of micro discussions, but the, the papers that are paywalled do find it harder, I think, to get break into that conversation. So that a piece that can happen in The Guardian, which may be replicating several papers, to be honest, an argument that, say, Owen Jones might make, there'll be other people in, the, in, in other places making that argument, but suddenly it will go you know, potentially viral because it's easily tweeted and shared in a way that uh, I've noticed, you know, in the, among the Westminster types, they might recommend a brilliant column by you or Janan Ganesh or something, but it only goes so far because it's paywalled to FT readers, whereas a Guardian piece can suddenly take off. And that politically, and the Emily Thornbury tweet, uh, you know, when that happened, I saw that t tweet, I saw Dan Hodges of The Telegraph had tweeted about it, I immediately <coughs> said we must have a piece on this, and the, the, there was a Guardian quick piece done very in 20 minutes on that, and that went round, and people were saying, well, if the Guardian think it's bad for Emily Thornbury, you know, a Labour person, then it's pretty bad for her. And that had a sort of political impact, uh, whereas, I in a way, if it had been somebody else writing that paywalled, I'm not sure it would have had the momentum. Although, funnily enough, that thing that went viral depended on an original newspaper campaign about white van man, didn't it? Mm -hmm. It was that we'd been, newspapers had been talking about white van man for years. It's that one picture told a story that could yes, then go viral. So in a funny way, it's, it, I, I like to think that newspapers have still got this massive influence even on the viral <laughs> stories. Yeah. But I'm going to throw it open because it's over to you guys. Um, ask our panellists whatever you like. Gentlemen down there. Um, Facebook have gone on and said it's going to be the election of conversation. What does the panel think about that? Do they agree, disagree and why? I don't know what it means. <laughs> you, 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 basically, you basically mean people talking on social media between each other, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, rather than down the pub. Is that...? Well, I, I, I think part of the question is how would you define it? Because they haven't really defined yeah. it. They just grabbed a headline. But yeah. actually, what does it mean? Well, I'll well, tell you just one thing. I don't, I don't understand the question, and I don't, I'm not on Facebook, but the Tories are spending <laughs> £100,000 a month advertising and getting their message on Facebook. I don't know how they're doing it, because I'm not on Facebook, so I probably ought to check. So they, see, they must see that that's an important way to reach the holy grail of youth, yeah. I imagine. F Facebook are incredibly important now in driving uh, people to newspapers, absolutely you know, huge, much more than somebody just sitting on a, you know, looking at their desktop. But the last election in 2010, YouGov did a, did a poll afterwards, they found 15% of voters said they'd been influenced by what was on social media, 15%. Uh, I think it'll be a lot higher on this occasion, and it's... You know, we fuel a lot of those debates on, uh, on, on Facebook, Twitter and everything because you produce the, uh, the original content, you report the news or you give the views and then people dissect it. And I actually, I actually love it because it actually, it actually keeps you honest because it's, uh, in your reporting it's, it's very difficult to tell the truth because you, you can't always get to it. But if you're truthful, people will uh, appreciate that. And they take, they take what you say and they, they spread it. I mean, I never thought the day, you know, you can just put something out and 80,000 people on Twitter straight off before anyone retweets it. Mm. You, that wouldn't have happened five years ago. Interesting, we've noticed that uh, in yeah. terms of generating traffic and audience for our stories, Facebook has a much yeah. bigger role than Twitter. Twitter yeah. is, in, is big among influencers, yeah. journalists yeah. talking to each other and determining, for example, Ellen, Emily Thornberry's fate, I think, was set, settled on Twitter. The kind of commentary it decided it was curtains for her and, and Labour had to move but in terms of actually driving numbers i think it is more facebook and still things like search nevertheless elections i think are still moved by knocking on doors getting vote out i think it's still offline as much as online i mean more and also i think perhaps social media amplifies often what is in yeah. the newspapers and uh, perhaps uh, in two ways um, partly because of the the impressions that are given these all Im important impressions but also the actual hard news which you get uh, in a newspaper. I mean, uh, it's a long time ago, but I think in the 1930s, uh, one of the reasons that uh, Roosevelt was successful, why he beat Hoover, was because the papers, whatever they, whichever one of them they were supporting in the presidential election, relentless uh, news stories about the depression, the misery, and people thought, we want hope, and they voted for FDR. So in both ways, I think you're back to newspapers. Uh, important though social media is in amplifying and extending that. Great stories, guys, great analysis, but I refuse to let you go without giving us all your individual predictions about the outcome of the election. Do your jobs properly, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a challenge. I'm going to start with uh, Steve. 
<laughs> I've asked him this question much. before about you six do, months ago, yeah, so well, I'm I, interested to hear what he has to I say now. I suspect you probably can't remember my answer, so it's, it's, it's <laughs> safer. <laughs> it's, it's actually a, a safer <laughs> task than it appears to be. Um, you, one of the uh, weird things about this, we all go around saying this is the least predictable election in our lifetimes, which is true. But it's also true that opinion polls on the whole are more reliable than they have ever been. Mm -hmm. So I believe the opinion polls, which suggests A, it will be a hung parliament, and as things currently stand, although Scotland is a real wild card, that Labour will be the biggest party in that parliament. So on the basis of the opinion polls and nothing else, I think at this moment in time, that's my prediction. But you'll have forgotten it, hopefully, by May the 5th or whatever in case it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What do you predict as well? The Conservatives are going to be the biggest party, and then you can get them, you know, one of them's going to be right. Yeah, <laughs> You're doing that's, both. That's sort of <laughs> cheating to, to accept. Yeah. Go and stick your neck out, Kevin. Um, yeah, it, it is hard. I, the, the, the more difficult elections recently, I, I was lucky enough to call right. 92, I didn't think Labour would win, I thought the Tories would. 2010, I didn't think Cameron would get an overall majority, it would be the biggest party. This, this is a lot harder, mm -hmm. but I, S Steve's right, if you look at the polls and, you, and what you know about the electoral system, it does look like Labour will be the biggest, the biggest party. We, in the mirror, we've got a poll out tomorrow, it'll be a social media later tonight, which would, uh, would confirm that, but that's not to say Labour end up the biggest party, but Miliband doesn't get to the finishing line, and he isn't stitched up again by uh, Cameron and Clegg doing, a, doing another deal. Jonathan. Uh, so rationally, uh, the, what uh, Steve and Kevin said is right. Uh, the, 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 uh, nevertheless, I think the polling will come down. Labour's share will come down a bit. But because of the electoral system, that still could lead them to have the biggest number of seats. Nevertheless, in my waters, I just see David Cameron carrying on as Prime Minister. And that's partly because of what we were talking about before. I somehow think, whatever the actual electoral arithmetic of it, in a kind of wisdom of crowds way, the British people probably don't want Ed Miliband to be Prime Minister and will find a way, somehow, through the strange alchemy of our electoral system, to make that their will done. Uh, and I, I, as I say, I don't even know mechanically how that will happen, but something, I think the scenario in which it's Clegg and Cameron, the numbers change, but back again, I think is probably where it is. But I think there's a lot of time between now and May still. I think it's most interesting because it's the first time the, p the parties we call the minor parties could have a big influence. We don't know how many seats UKIP will get. I don't think very many. I think the Greens, who are doing very well, um, are going to steal votes from the <coughs> Labour Party. Yeah. But uh, my hunch is this. It will be the Tories the largest party, and partly because Scotland is turning yeah. into a disaster zone for the Labour Party. They've got 41 MPs at the moment. The SNP have about five or six. That, they could have 25 or 30 next time. And one of the reasons why... In, almost inconceivable, it's, it's hard to believe, but David Cameron is the, first Scot it's the first Tory leader to be more popular in Scotland than the Labour leader. That is quite an achievement for Ed Miliband. And in fact, there is a statistic, <laughs> there is a statistic which was in a daily record poll which shows more people in Scotland believe in Lo the Loch Ness Monster than they do Ed Miliband. <laughs> and that's why I think the Tories will limp home. But I tell you what, it's, it's, a, it's a plague on all their houses because I think most people, and the shenanigans of Sir Malcolm Rifkin and Jack yeah. Straw the other day, people are just sick to death of the lot of them, really. I think I, I absolutely agree with that. I think we're going to have a multi-party government at the end of the day, almost certainly. It's possible the polls could suddenly break one way very near the election, but I doubt it. I don't think either of them are going to get past the, uh, the finishing line. I think the public is absolutely brassed off with the two old, dying, crumbling major parties. I mean, you can see that in the collapse of their membership. They once both had millions, now they've got... I think they've all, even if you add them all up together, it's fewer members than the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and where once 97% of the population either voted Labour or Tory last time round, it was uh, uh, just under two thirds. So I think either of them is going to have to um, really fight for uh, supporters. Maybe um, Labour would gang up with the SNP, although no. there could be all sorts of a really, really amazing combinations. The Tories with the Irish and, of course, with the Lib Dems, um, all sorts of unknown factors. 
uh, like parties having to approve new coalitions. I think it'll be a minority government, not a, um, a formal coalition. It'll be much more hand to mouth. And I think um, it could take an awful lot longer than it did last time to form some sort of government. Uh, and I think we could also have some fairly major changes in, for instance, for first past the post. I mean, one of the things that could happen, I think this is less likely given the uh, situation in Scotland, if Labour and Tory both got 33% of the vote, it would be technically possible for Labour to have over 50 seats more than the Tories because of the way the constituencies are drawn and because of first past the post. And I don't think we can go on any longer. I think there are going to be huge questions for everybody, including the voters. One good thing, possibly, is that because it's going to be a really, really tight election, I think the press will be far more influential. That little bit of difference uh, could make a lot of difference um, on the night. And I also think we might see an increase in turnout because people will think, well, even if it's a negative way, mm. I've got to get out X or Y or Z, got to stop them getting in in my constituency. Just in 10 seconds, if you're right, and I think it could well be that there's a minority government, I guarantee there will have to be a second mm, election okay. quickly. Yeah. Um, I, I Very difficult to do. No, but it'll have to happen. I, I, I did a program about 1974 for Radio 4 recently where there was a minority Labour government. Uh, and spoke to the few kind of active survivors of that cabinet, Shirley Williams, people like that, who made a key point, which was I hadn't thought about, that they were just physically exhausted after mm -hmm. about two or three months, being, you know, the traps at midnight by the other parties, mm -hmm. looking after their marginal seats, knowing an election might happen, and all the rest of it. On top of all the other demands, they just physically could not keep going. And she said it's impossible to literally survive as human beings for five years as a minority government. So if that happens, I reckon there'll be a second election. Well, but but they, won't, they won't have the money <laughs> apart from anything else. Yeah. And well, also the five-year Parliament yeah. Act well, makes it that, very, that very hard. The fixed-term Parliament Act is a disaster right, right, and right. needs to be sorted out. Yeah. Yeah. All right, now we're getting very close to the yeah. end. but um, And it sounds like we might have weeks and months of sport for newspapers. Have we got, yeah. one, have we got yes. one... Have we got another question? Hi, just, uh, hi, Demi at PhD. Um, just a question about UKIP. Um, Sorry, I can't see you, sir. Where are you coming Hi, from? I'm here. Yeah, oh, hello. yeah, I'm a bit blind. Uh, just a, just a question yeah. about UKIP. Why do, you th why do you think that the major political parties have sort of failed to deal with this issue of immigration? Um, that's almost linked to the reason why UKIP have sort of been really popular uh, at the moment, and obviously they, they seem to win possibly four or five seats in this election. What's the panel's take on it? Jonathan. Well, you know, it depends on accepting your premise that they haven't dealt with it. I mean, the, the big problem is that the numbers are absolute and the only way of actually getting the numbers down uh, would be to end free movement within the European Union. And if once you're in the European Union, people are going to move in and out of uh, those member state countries and they're going to come to a successful and prosperous and stable country <coughs> like Britain. So uh, that, you know, if that counts as not dealing with it, then that's the problem. What you've got politically is you've got a uh, Prime Minister, and now I think to some extent, in Ed Miliband, a Labour leader, who don't want to say what I just said. Um, they don't want to say that this is a mark of a successful society, not a failing society. You know, people are not emigrating to Romania. Uh, they they want to come here, and that's something you live with unless you pull out of the European Union. So uh, very few people want to say that, and so Nigel Farage has left an open field in which to say, see, the same as usual, Westminster parties won't deal with the real problems, etc., uh, because of that stubborn fact. My fear is the five million Brits living abroad all come back, <laughs> particularly the <laughs> seven, particularly the 750,000 shouting at Spanish waiters. Do we really want them coming here, causing chaos, <laughs> uh, abusing our honourable, bold waiters? Uh. <laughs> They'd probably all vote Tory if they came uh, back. Yeah. I think Grant Shapps has got his eye on them. Can I just say on immigration, one of the problems of immigration, it's all very well for Nasty Nige to say, oh, well, we'll sort it. But of course, there are loads of immigrants, however <coughs> anti-immigrant you might be, that sheer common sense um, dictates that we really, really want here. You want people who are going to come and invest in this country and create jobs. You want bright students who are going to pay good money to go to our brilliant universities and then go back and perhaps be 
with a bit of luck, ambassadors for Britain for the rest of their lives. I mean, the idea that there is some way of switching off the tap uh, if, if it is, is nonsense because it's not desirable, let alone even if we did pull out of the European Union. Um, and that is not something uh, that is really, really being addressed by anybody. It makes it very difficult for the politicians because they're trying to be populist, trying to please. And the other thing is, of course, that the public thinks that there are far more immigrants than they are. And I think it was in Rochester and Strood where UKIP did really well. Um, and there's hardly any immigrants there. And there's this perception. I'm getting yeah. a flashing red light. <laughs> I know Andrew briefly. wants to say, say something, and then we're just going to wrap up. No, just to answer very briefly yeah. David's question, I'll tell you why you could be doing well, because the political parties are ignoring it. So David Cameron had six mm. priorities on his... Uh, in the run-up to election campaign, immigration wasn't mentioned. And don't forget my old mate Red Ed Miliband's conference speech. He forgot to mention the deficit and he forgot to mention immigration. So there you have why you could be doing very well. OK, well, that's all we've got time for, but I hope you've had a good indication of the fun to be had in the coming months. And uh, thanks for listening to us. Thank you.